Welcome to worship. I want to welcome everyone here, those who are visiting with us. We trust that we come into the presence of God together and we can celebrate together His goodness and His grace in our lives. I have no announcements other than one I will make before prayer. So let's come together now in a moment of, of prayer as we ask God to bless our time together. Heavenly Father, it is in your, into your presence that we come on this special day, a day of worship, a day of all the week the best, an emblem of our eternal rest. Father, we pray that you will help us to focus on that which provides our eternal rest, your grace to us, your promise keeping, your faithfulness, your presence in our lives, your coming into our lives in the person of Jesus Christ. So, Father, as we focus on those blessings and our call to live by faith, we pray that you will bless us by the power of your Spirit. So receive our worship, bless your word, bless our giving. And may all that we do be honoring and pleasing to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for a call to worship. In a little while, we'll be reading from Psalm 30. But in the middle of that psalm, verses 4 and 5, there are these words, Sing to the Lord, you saints of His. Imagine being called saints of the Lord. Praise His holy name. Why? For His anger lasts only a moment, but His favor, His grace, lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Let's sing together the words of number 188, praise the Lord, sing hallelujah. Let's sing those three stanzas.
praise Him because our help is in the name of the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth, our Creator God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Receive His greeting, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ through the power and presence of His Holy Spirit. Amen. And as God has greeted us and welcomed us, let's turn and welcome and greet one another. You may be seated. I'm going to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 30. This week at our staff meeting, Pastor John brought an article for us to read, and it was an article by, uh, out of, Christ, out of uh, Christianity Today talking about a book by N.T. Wright in which he talks about the Psalms as Jesus' prayer book. In fact, Jesus used the words of Psalms often as he prayed. And as, we, uh, as I visit you know, elderly folks, I find more and more of them talking about they read Psalms. Maybe before they go to bed at night, they read a Psalm or some are reading through the Psalms because you know, once we understand the way of salvation, but know that we still live in a broken world, a world of struggle and pain and aging and disease, it's good to read those verses of the Psalms that look at human life as they experienced it in the presence of God and as we experience it. Psalm 30 is one of those Psalms in which the psalmist faces his enemies. He faces struggles in life but he exalts the Lord. We'll, we'll read that psalm and then we'll sing from the blue psalter the words of that psalm. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of His, praise His holy name, for His anger lasts only a moment, but His favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. O oh Lord, when You favored me, You made my mountain stand firm. And when You hid Your face, I was dismayed. To You, O oh Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction, in my going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. Let's sing the words of that psalm, O Lord, by Thee delivered, and maybe some of the younger folks have never sung that song, it came out of the blue psalter, but it's a beautiful five verses, and let's sing those together.
Deb found this song. She thought it would fit this series I have been going through of Hebrews, Living by Faith. She's got some fifth graders that are going to help us sing it. Let's sing those verses together as a song of preparation. Thank you, Deb and young folks, for helping us sing that song of faith. We're working our way through 
Hebrews 11. We, are not, we, we haven't told all the stories. But we come to uh, toward the, the end, and it, it seems like our tour guide's kind of in a hurry. He wants to get us through the tour. And so he says, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about David. David, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Let's tell his story. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let's pray together before we read. Father, as we come into your presence and our call to proclaim your word, we ask for your spirit to be with us as proclaimers and as listeners, so that this story may speak to us about living life in your presence, in the midst, standing between powerful forces. Help us to learn what it means to live by faith. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So kind of a long chapter, so I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, it's 1 Samuel 17, 1 Samuel 17, and I took my Bible along, so I'm not sure if the page in your Bible on the, at the pew is the same, but the story goes like this. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sokka in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes. Damon between Saka and Ezekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. That's the setting. A champion named Goliath who came from Gath came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its point, iron point weighed 600 shekels. His armor shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to, to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, This the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let, him, let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now we skip a couple of verses. We go to 16. Uh, for 40 days uh, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses for the, to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning David left the flock with a shepherd loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle position, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. 
David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, This is what will be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speak with the men. Speaking with the men, he, he burned with anger at him and said, asked, Why have you come down here? And, and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You, you came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can I even speak? He ten, then turned away to someone else and brought up the same manner. The men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. <laughs> Saul replied, you're not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy, and he's been a fighting man from his youth. David, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping your father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine." Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd bag, and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine and his shield bearer in front of him kept clo coming closer to David. He looked David over and, and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? The Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give, you, give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said, to the Philistine, I come against, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me. I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear that God saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank deep into his forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Thus far, we will read. <clears throat> so people of God, can we squeeze one more story out of our tour guide as he, as he takes us on this tour of the gallery? Our guide has hinted that he doesn't have time to tell us about all of these people who in the Old Covenant lived by faith, but then he keeps bringing up these names, these names to which some very fascinating stories are attached. He mentions David, and there's some stories about David that fascinate us. So we ask, can you, one more, can you tell us about David? We love to hear that story. When I was in the fourth grade, our, our teacher in a little Christian school in Holland, Minnesota, gave us an assignment. She said, tomorrow you all come back prepared to tell a Bible story. I promptly forgot to prepare. So the next day, I, when it came time to tell the story, I had to scramble. I had to sort of wing it. But I remembered the story of David and Goliath, and, and that's the story I told. This is a story that our children learn quite young in life, early in life. 
It's a good story to learn. Eugene Peterson, in his book, Leaping Over the Wall, made this observation that children need to know the story of David and Goliath in order to make it in life. In order to make it in life. Why is that story that important? What does he mean, make it in life? Let's see once if in the process of retelling the story we can reach that same conclusion as to why this is a vital story for our children to know and to be able to tell. Why is this teenager's expression of faith so valuable for our lives? Now in telling and in retelling this story, we often make David out to be the hero of the story. But as I said earlier, you know, I don't like that idea of hero. We should call them survivors. But people like to look at, look at him as the hero because, you know, he stunned that giant with that stone slung with a practice slingshot. But what kind of hero would David be? What kind of survivor is he? Why is his story important? Well, let's watch him as he walks down to that creek to select five smooth stones. Is this not a place that would call for absolute terror? Here is this boy, teenager, 13, 15, 17, something like that, dressed in a, in a simple robe of a shepherd, carrying a walking stick that you could, I suppose, be used as a, as a club, and carrying a slingshot which amounted to a little patch of leather and a couple of strings attached to it. But here he stands between two military forces, between two armies. On the one ridge is the petrified army of Israel, sitting back in terror, armed with a few swords, and a few of them had armor, but most of them brought tools from the farm in order to fight the battle. You see, in those days, the Philistines, which, who had a superior culture to Israel, had control of the blacksmithing and ironworking business. And so if, a, if an Israelite farmer needed his hoe or his uh, sickle sharpened, he had to go to the Philistines to get it done. And, and the Philistine blacksmiths were under strict orders. You don't sharpen a spear or a sword for an Israelite. In fact, one place we read in, in, the, in the Bible, in the story, that uh, only Saul and his son Jonathan had decent swords to fight with. That's one ridge. On the other ridge there stood the powerful army of the Philistines, armed to the teeth, armed to, uh, determined to absorb the Israelite nation into their kingdom, into their culture, and into the worship of their gods. But these Philistines had developed a rather unique way of, of doing battle, a way that saved the life of a lot of young men. I sometimes wonder why people don't try something like that today if we leaders are determined to fight. Put them in the ring. My dad used to say that way back in the 50s. Why don't they, these leaders go put on gloves and they go, go at it and then the rest of us can stay alive? Doesn't work that way, I guess. But anyway, these Philistines would do some selective breeding with tall, powerful men, with tall, strong women, and they would produce tall, powerful sons who would be trained from the time they were little to be duelists, fighters, who would challenge then the best fighter of an, of an opposing army, and whoever would win that army would be subject to the Philistines, and they would give up territory to the Philistine army. And so for 40 days, this, this champion duelist from the Philistines named Goliath had challenged Israel to send out their champion, their best fighter, to take him on in, in, in a winner-take-all contest. Well, the champion of Israel was supposed to be their king, Saul, who was quite a figure of a man in his own right. Bible says Our Bible said he stand, stood nigh, uh, uh, taller than every other man around. By the way, 
our, our text said that Goliath stood nine feet tall. Some folks assume that some scribe must have put it in that way when he was writing, rewriting the scripture text because uh, 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 the book of 1 Samuel found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, among the Dead Sea Scrolls, listed Goliath as only seven feet tall. Not that that would make a whole lot of difference. Anyway, the champion should have been Saul. But for 40 days, neither Saul nor anyone in the army dared to accept the challenge of Goliath to come and fight him. So we come back to David in the creek, selecting, selecting five smooth stones, carrying his walking stick and shepherd's bag and a slingshot. David, the boy, has volunteered to face the champion, Goliath. That Philistine dueler. He stands, it seems, between a huge, well-armed army of the Philistines, between the powerful, well-armed Goliath and the defeat of Israel's army. Just a boy. He stands between Israel continuing as a nation under the covenant God and a nation being subjected to a false culture, a false god, the gods of the Philistines. He stands between Israel being the people of God, set apart, chosen, formed to serve the one true God in the land that He gave them, and being absorbed into the heathen culture with all its wickedness and idolatry and evil. And coming down that hill, his 125-pound armor clanging with every step, his 15-pound sword gleaming in the sunshine, was the warrior Goliath. And there's this boy in the creek with a slingshot and five smooth stones. Talk about a vulnerable position. Talk about the weight of the kingdom of God's future resting on your shoulders. Talk about... The, 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 being in a position where the, the future of Israel being a blessing to all the nations of the world resting right here on this kid's shoulders. Perhaps the coming of Jesus out of Israel to be Savior and Lord for the salvation of, 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 of the creation and God's people rests right here on the shoulders of this boy. So why is he so calmly selecting five stones while Goliath, fully armed, is marching toward him? Why is he not filled with fear, absolute terror like Saul and big brother Eliab and the rest of the Israelite soldiers? Well, let's back up a bit and find out why. When the battle started, David had been sent home from playing the harp in Saul's palace, back to uh, the sheep ranch of Jesse. But since his brothers, three of his brothers were in the army, and, and these were the days before quartermasters and supply sergeants, families had to bring food to their, brother, their brothers, their sons, or husbands who were in the army. So Jesse called David to uh, take this bundle of food to his brothers and see how they were doing. David takes the food and he arrives at the Israelite army camp about the time that Goliath comes out to issue his challenge once more. Send out your champion to fight me in a winner-take-all contest. He makes a challenge in such a way that he degrades and calls into question the reliability, the faithfulness, the power of Israel's covenant God. David hears the challenge and he doesn't like it. He sees no Israelites stepping forward to meet the challenge. David heard soldiers around him remind themselves of what Saul had promised to anybody who would stand in for him to face Goliath. Brother, Big brother Eliab covered up his own cowardice by making some he-man re re rebuke of his little brother. What are you doing here leaving those sheep and sticking your nose into a man's business? Well, the interest of David was conveyed to Saul, summoned David into his presence. David offers to go and fight the giant. 
Saul, of course, puts him down. You're just a, just a boy, just a boy. And Goliath is this tr trained fighting man from his youth. And that's when David gives the first hint as to why he is not the hero, and yet why he dares to face this heavenly armed giant with his sling and his five smooth stones. He gives a clue as to why the story of David and Goliath is a story that every child should know in order to make it through life. David told Saul, I've been out in the wilderness herding sheep, taking care of them. I, I face lions, I, I face bears. But along the way, God delivered me from their paws and their jaws. I've been practicing the presence of God, the promises of God in my life for a long time. I have met a lot of danger already in my life. I've learned to trust. I've learned to trust God's promises and God's presence and God's care. I've learned to live by faith. I have confidence that this same God who, who protected me from those lions and those bears in the past will protect me now as I face this giant who has defied the true and living God, the God of covenant grace. Well, Saul offered David his, his armor and his helmet and his sword. The armor was ill-fitting and useless because it was too big, but it was also too small. David's vision, his practice of the presence of God, his faith in God's promises and of, of care and protection has no room for the need for any kind of weapons like this. Words that Paul penned many years later in the New Testament spoke of what David and Israel was to learn, what David believed and what Israel was to learn. When I am weak, then I am strong. Without swords, without spears, but with faith and trust in their God. That's the position God wanted His people to be in. And David left a model for faith in weakness. And so we follow this ill-equipped yet properly prepared teenager down to the creek, watch him select those five smooth stones, we see him straighten up and begin to move toward that approaching giant, Goliath. The giant is filled with absolute contempt for this, for this kid. This kid with the club and the slingshot. He despises him for his weapons. He despises his God. He tells David what he's going to do to his body. But David says, you come at me with a sword and a javelin and spear. But I come to you in the name of the God of Israel, the God whom you have been def defying. And now we know why he could so calmly collect, select five smooth stones from the creek. David's vision of reality stands in total contrast to the vision of the soldiers on each hill. To Israel's shame. His vision was shaped by faith in the presence of God. In contrast to the vision of Eliab and the vision of Saul and the vision of Israel's army, whose, whose vision is shaped only by fear, fear of Goliath, fear of the giant. And his vision also stands in contrast to the vision of the Philistine army, which was dominated by Goliath trust. David wrote a poem about this some time later. He wrote, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we will trust in the name of our God. David's not a hero. This is the Lord's battle. These are God's people. This is His covenant. This is His plan of redemption. And he stands in the breach. 
And it will be won, not by weapons of iron, but by trust, by confidence in the Lord, in His presence, and in His promises. So David practiced the presence of God in his life one more time. He had courage to stand between those two armies. He had courage to stand between Israel and her defeat. Between Israel remaining the people of God, from which Jesus would come, and a people enslaved to the false god Dagon. His vision of that whole situation was God-dominated. And so with that long-practiced vision of faith, learned at an early age, with a vision of God in control, God in charge, David used just one of those five smooth stones. And with a skilled, God-directed shot, sunk that stone into the forehead of the Goliath, stunning him. And the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And he allowed David to take off his head with Goliath's own sword. And that's why we need to know the story of David and Goliath in order to make it in life. We learn to live by faith. We learn to practice that faith in the presence of God Faith in the coming of His kingdom. Faith in the surety of His covenant promises. And we practice that faith while we live life between fear and trust in our culture's Goliaths. We live in a secular culture, you know, a secular society. A society which is decreasing its practice of God's presence in our lives. God's law, it's old, it's irrelevant. His way of making things in His created plan and order, that's old-fashioned. His word is neglected. God's presence, a, a, a Sunday morning thing, if at all, if we have time and if no fun stands in the way. Because you see, we're rich enough, we're scientific enough, we're educated enough, we're sophisticated enough to make our own decisions, to solve our own problems, and decide for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. Salvation through reason, through science, if neither one of them work, the government will take care of us. It's a culture of Goliath trust, of human optimism where trust is directed toward the, toward the armor of, of human science and human abilities and human skills and big government. On the other hand, the other side, on the other mountain, there's this culture of fear, a culture do- dominated by Goliath fear, fear of nuclear war, Fear of tomorrow and what it might bring. A a fear of puny potentates and terrorists getting their hands on nuclear weapons. Fear of economic turn down. A fear of social security running out of money. A fear of tyranny. A fear of disease, illness. Hands, many hands are wrung in worry. But if we and our children are going to make it in life, Make it through life. We're going to have to live somewhere between that fear and the wrong kind of trust. We will make it if we learn what David learned early in life, to practice the presence of God, to trust His promise and His care. That takes training, that takes teaching, that takes time spent in the Word. That requires faith in the Word and the promises of God. Faith in God as our Father, faith in the coming of His kingdom, faith in the, in the salvation work and in the Lordship of, our, of Jesus Christ. Whether we're working or playing, whether it's Sunday or Wednesday, whether in sickness or in health, in wealth or in poverty, farming or doing business, retired or active, young or old, 
We need to learn to practice by faith the presence of God, the reliability of His promises, the coming of His kingdom. So people of God, we live our lives somewhere between the giants of godless secularism and the enemy of God-doubting fear to make it in life, to make it through this life and into the life to come. We need to know God, the God of grace. We need, need to know His Son, Jesus Christ, and it'll help us to know the story of David and Goliath, where we see an active faith on the part of a teenager at work, practicing the gracious, promised presence of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ against all odds. Amen. Thank you, Father, for this story. Help us to live by faith. We rejoice in this story, this, this example of one who, though he was weak, yet he was strong. Couldn't use the weapons that so many folks rely on, but he lived by faith. He lived by trust. Father, help us all to make it through life, young and old, trusting your presence, trusting the reliability of your promises, trusting the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the power of your Spirit, make that so. In his name we pray. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Let's stand and sing those three stanzas.
one announcement before prayer, and that is that Donna Obink asks us to remember in prayer her daughter-in-law, Cindy Obink, uh, her son's uh, wife who is experiencing cancer, dealing with cancer, and is going, undergoing chemo treatments. So we want to remember her. Let's come to God in prayer. Father, this is our story. This is our song. Song of redemption, song of grace. Thank you that we can sing it. That we've been trained in this faith. That it was the faith of parents, grandparents, and they passed it on. That we're born as members of your church and baptized and received the sacramental promises, sealed with water, and finally, ultimately, sealed in the blood of Jesus. Father, we think about that. We could have been born in a different culture and been raised to serve a false god. But in your grace and in your mercy, through your electing grace, you made us part of your church so that we can sing together a song, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Fill our lives with faith. Help us always to live in your presence, trusting your promises trusting your grace, trusting the finished work of Jesus Christ so that we see your kingdom come. We have a vision for the coming of your kingdom. We see, you have a vision of history moving toward our Father's redemptive, purposeful end. And in the meantime, make us loyal servants, serving with our gifts and our offerings, serving with our time and our talents, serving with our mouth, serving with our hands and our feet, serving the coming and the building of your kingdom. So we, bless, we pray for a blessing on the giving of gifts tonight as we give our gifts for the work of Atlas. We thank you for their ministry. We thank you for the lives that they touch. And we pray, Father, that these gifts may be multiplied to touch many lives. We pray for all the missionaries who serve us, we send, whom we send out that our denomination sends out, <clears throat> that are sent out by the Christian church around the world. People of different denominations and different backgrounds, but, but preaching the good news of the gospel. Build your church to the spread of the gospel and bless all the missionaries that represent us and all of them that serve. We pray, Father, that your church may be built. We pray for your church in, struggle, in, in, in difficult situations and circumstances for the Christians in Egypt where churches are burned, Christians in other, part of the, other parts of the world who have to worship in secret, Christians who dare, dare to speak of their faith and because the national religion is going to come down on them. Father, make your people strong. Build your church. We pray, Father, for the troubled spots of the world and, and Syria and Egypt and we pray, Father, make wise, help leaders to make wise decisions. Help them to do the right thing so that war may be averted, that lives may be spared, and that people may recognize the futility of going to war. Give good leadership to these countries where the troubled spots are. Frustrate the purpose of terrorists and and those who have nuclear weapon aspirations. Father, we pray for peace in your world. Father, we ask that you'll go with us this week and all that we do. Bless the children, young people, young adults going back to school. Bless their teachers. We pray that the children may learn well. Young people, young adults may learn well. Bless their professors, all of those instructing them. Give them strength and wisdom. We pray that in the learning process we may gain knowledge, but at the same time then in the process gain wisdom for living as your people, living by faith, being your servants. Go with us this week that is ahead of us. We pray, Father, for uh, harvest operations that go on. We pray that you'll protect the harvesters, keep them in your care. We pray, Father, for a good harvest, a good return on our, our work. 
and good use being made of that which you allow us to profit. So, Father, we pray that you will give wisdom and safety and protection. Bless us in all our work and tasks. Bless us in our retirements that we may be faithful in finding opportunities to serve and taking them. Father, we pray that you will bless the celebration in a while. We thank you for new babies. We thank you for another generation rising up. We pray, Father, for all of those who are, are parenting these children and all of those who have committed to teaching them church school classes. We pray, Father, that they may grow in grace and in wisdom. So care for the folks who have special needs, the folks who are going to, through treatments, those who are dealing with, the, with that enemy cancer. We pray that they may not be overcome, that their faith may not be overcome. But in the case of, like Joanne Hoagland, that she may be given the strength, and Dick too, the strength to deal with this. And look ahead with faith and with hope. We pray, Father, for Donna Obink's daughter-in-law. We pray for the treatment that she's receiving. We pray that you'll bless these treatments. Make them effective in her life, in her body, that she may too become cancer-free. Continue to bless the treatments that Ed receives. May these be blessing, a blessing to him too. So care for all your people who need, need you in any special way. So, Father, we pray that you will receive our worship, bless your word, forgive our sins, and help us to serve you as we should. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our offering is for Atlas. Let's present to this work the gifts that we have brought.
Let's stand and make our confession of faith. Uh, let's notice this morning you celebrated the 450th anniversary of the Heidelberg Catechism, and you recited question and answer one, story of grace. How do we receive grace? We receive it by faith. And that is also expressed uh, later on in the Heidelberg Catechism, and we'll recite those together. I'll ask the questions. Let's read the answers together. What good does it do you then to believe all of this? In Christ I am right with God and heir to everlasting. How are you right with God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all of God's commandments and of never having kept any of them, and even though I am still inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, without my deserving it, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need to do is accept this gift with a, with a believing heart. Let's sing together now, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. We'll sing two stanzas, receive the benediction, now we'll sing the, the last stanza as a grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.